Thank you very much, uh, Thomas and Stephen. It's really humbling for me to be here. And the reason it's humbling, and the reason I was so keen to come, is because it's young people like you who are going to take on the world and make a difference. And what I want to share over the next uh, little while is how you might think about doing that using innovation, bold ideas with big impact. And my name is really at Peter A. Singer, so we can carry on the conversation on Twitter afterwards. The question that I want to ask and I want you to reflect on is, what's the best recipe for creating a poor country? What is the best way for making sure a poor country stays poor? If you were an evil scientist and you wanted to make sure a poor country stayed poor, what would you do? Or to use this metaphor, if you were an evil chef and you wanted to make sure a poor country stayed poor, what would you do? It's the counterfactual question, but it's really worthwhile. You know, we're used to talking about all the great things we do, uh, and you are used to talking about the great things you do. It's worth switching the question around to really try and understand what's fundamental and where you can be transformational. Well, here's one answer to that question, how do you keep a poor country poor? And that is to have poor governance and poor macroeconomics. And on this slide is uh, this young man is the poster child, or a poster child, for poor governance, poor macroeconomics. Anyone recognize this young man? Sure, Kim Jong-un from North Korea. But that's a pretty obvious way to screw up a country and make sure it's poor and it stays poor. Are there any less obvious and more subtle ways that we can think of? Well, here's one. You could have high death rates for women and children. And this is a picture of Jeremiah from Western Kenya, who sadly, just before this picture was taken, uh, lost his wife in pregnancy and childbirth. She was uh, giving, uh, giving birth. And the reason having high death rates for women and children is a pretty good way to make sure a poor country stays poor is because it incentivizes large family sizes and ensures resource scarcity. If you know that some of your kids are going to die, you're going to have a lot of them to make sure that they're there to till the field, et cetera. And this chart just shows that. This is a map of the world showing the darkest areas are where most of the women die in pregnancy and childbirth. Sadly, about 300,000 women die in pregnancy and childbirth every year, most of them in the developing world, most of those deaths preventable. This slide shows uh, where the children die, um, and you can see it's exactly the same regions. Sadly, there's about 6.9 million children who die uh, every year under the age of five. And this slide uh, shows total fertility rate. So you can see that the mother's deaths, the children's deaths, and the fertility rates totally line up. Because this is a pretty good way, having high death rates of women and children, to make sure a poor country stays poor. Can you think of any other ways to make sure a poor country stays poor? Here's a pretty good one, which is impede the cognitive development of the children that do survive. So there's about 200,000 kids around the world who will never reach their full cognitive or intellectual or social potential. Why? It's due to causes like prematurity, and this picture is of a premature baby, or uh, malnutrition, or lack of stimulation from parents and other adults, or infections. 200 million kids who in the first one or 2,000 days of life have their brains damaged by those factors, and that damage is locked in forever, and those kids will never reach their full potential. Think how much creativity and talent are emphasized in your school. Well, imagine wiping a lot of that out by the time you're two, and you understand that this is a pretty good way to make sure a poor country stays poor. Can you think of any others? Well, here's one. You could leave mental illness untreated. About 15% of the global burden of uh, disease is due to mental health conditions and mental illnesses. Most people with mental illness in the developing world are not treated, and much worse, they're highly stigmatized. So here's a picture of a young boy chained to a bench. You know, when I was in Uganda, I met a social worker 
who told me the following story. He said, I went to this family and I asked the father and mother, how many children do you have? And the father said, well, we have four children and another one. And the social worker was confused. He said, well, can you show me your children? So the father brings out four children. Social worker says, well, where's the other one? Father leads him back to the back of the house, back of the hut, unlocks a door, and there behind the locked door is the fifth child, a young child with mental illness who's untreated and so stigmatized that that father and mother don't even see them as one of their, don't even see him as one of their regular children. Pretty good way to make sure a poor country stays poor. Finally, um, I think another really good way to make sure that a poor country stays poor is to make sure that no innovative ideas that people have in that country are translated into products, services, to start businesses, to start social enterprises. This is a picture of a professor at Makere University in Kampala, Uganda, uh, Moses Musazi. And he's invented this really cool device. This is an incinerator for medical waste. Think about all the vaccination campaigns in the developing world and where all those syringes go. This incinerator, the cool thing about it is it doesn't need any fuel. But it's stuck at the prototype stage. It's never gone to scale, there's no capital, and there's no business mentorship to make sure that Moses' ideas are translated into products, services, and companies. You know, there's really only two forms of wealth a country can have. One is resources in the ground that you exploit in a non-corrupt manner. And the second is mining the ideas in the brains of people. And that's why these factors are so significant. In fact, you can think about this as a stagnant technology. And we've identified many stagnant technologies throughout the developing world that never reach the people who need them. You can even think about them as constipated technologies. Now, if you turn that question around, though, and this is where you cue the happy music, and ask yourself the other side of the question, the way we normally ask that question, what's the best recipe for helping poor countries overcome poverty? How do you make sure a poor country does not stay poor? There actually is a lot of hope, and I want to share that with you. And the hope can be found in a single word, innovation, doing things differently, bold ideas with big impact, especially ideas on the part of people on the ground in countries. So um, I'll skip over the obvious uh, Kim Jong-un uh, governance and macroeconomics one and go to the non-obvious ways to make sure a poor country doesn't stay poor using innovation. One way is actually to reduce the death rates for women and children. And uh, we're very proud with a number of partners shown on this slide to support a program called Saving Lives at Birth, which focuses innovation on the 72 hours around the time of birth. Because sadly, 150,000 of the 300,000 women who die in pregnancy and childbirth die in just 72 hours around the time of birth. And 1.6 million children of those 6.9 million children who die under the age of five die within 72 hours around the time of birth. We need innovations really targeting that critical window to reduce death rates of women and children. And here's an example of one. It's called the ODON device. It's the first innovation in assisted vaginal delivery in hundreds of years since vacuum suction, since forceps. It's for arrested labor when the labor slows down or stops. And uh, that is a key cause of the death of women and children. And the ODON device is like a little bag that goes over the head of the baby and helps guide the baby out the birth canal in the case of arrested labor. And the key thing here is that that means that a much lower skilled worker, health worker, can deliver the baby further from a health facility. This program also supports some other very cool innovations, like, for example, uh, a company in Nairobi called Chamganka MicroHealth, which is using electronic vouchers on mobile phones. So women who are in the midst of delivery 
can actually pay the taxi driver to get to the health clinic because uh, lack of transportation is a key cause of the deaths of women. We're also supporting uh, a group in northern Nigeria led by Aminu Gawama. Now Aminu's mom died in pregnancy and childbirth very sadly and he's committed himself uh, to reducing the deaths of uh, women and children in Nigeria and what he is doing is working with, um, uh, with imams to provide positive health messaging around childbirth through, uh, through mosques at Friday prayers. The reason I went over those three examples is the first one was an example of science and technology, the Odon device. And by the way, the way that people thought about the Odon device is Jorge Odon in Argentina, the inventor, was getting his car fixed at a mechanic's garage, and he noticed that the mechanics were playing a little party trick. They were trying to take a cork out of a wine bottle, guiding the cork using a balloon out of the mouth of the wine bottle. And so you see how that idea translated into this Odon device. This is an example of science and technology innovation. Uh, the example I gave you about Chamganka is an example of a business innovation. And the example about the imams is an example of social innovation. So the point I want to make here is that innovation is a very wide suite of things. And any of those channels are open to you to pursue to take on the world. And the more you combine them, the more likely it is your innovation is going to go to scale and be sustainable. So we can reduce the death weights of women and children. That's a way to make sure a poor country doesn't stay poor. We can promote the cognitive development of children and uh, essentially uh, do saving brains. On the left is uh, Carly Silver, Dr. Carly Silver, who's a program officer with us, holding Annie. And you can see Annie is now well fed. And most importantly, she's being stimulated by Carly because that really helps the development of Annie's brain. On the right, you see another innovation, um, which is kangaroo mother care. This is a premature baby being held close to the chest of the mother for a period of time after birth. We know that this actually saves the life of the baby, helps to save babies' lives. And it's starting to look like it also helps to save babies' brains. So when you think about those 200 million kids who never reach their full potential, these sorts of innovations can also help to save lives. And just as importantly, save brains and help the children develop. We can address mental health issues. It's another great way to make sure that a poor country doesn't stay poor. This is a picture of a lay health worker on a friendship bench in Zimbabwe, essentially providing counseling uh, to a woman with a mental health condition. This is probably maternal depression, judging by the picture. Depression, a very common uh, problem throughout the world. You know, the issue here is that there are 250 times as many psychiatrists per person in Canada as compared to a country like Ethiopia. So you can't use the same sort of models to deliver mental health services. You need to innovate with lay health workers, and this is exactly what you're seeing here. So addressing mental health issues is also a good way to make sure a poor country uh, doesn't stay poor. And finally, and very importantly, supporting and encouraging innovation. So on the left is Fredros Akumu from Tanzania. He noticed that when kids were playing soccer, their smelly socks, much like these socks here, attracted mosquitoes. So what he did was he took these smelly socks, he isolated the chemical in them that was attracting the mosquito, put it in the box you see there, and, uh, and uh, don't worry, those are clean. <laughs> Put it in the box you see there, and they attract mosquitoes, and they're killed by insecticide, and they can't transmit malaria or dengue fever. And it's complementary to other anti-malarial therapies. Next to him, you see Kareem Kareem, who's developed a cheap pixel technology and produced a digital x-ray device that's being tested against tuberculosis with chest x-rays in India. Ophira Ginsberg has developed a cell phone-based early screening and referral system for women with breast cancer, breast cancer in Bangladesh. Jan Andrasek has developed a new type of polymer that um, makes an artificial knee joint, a knee prosthesis. And that knee prosthesis um, is 50 bucks compared to most others that are available on the market at one or $2,000, so much more affordable. 
He's testing it with landmine victims in various parts of the developing world. And on the right is Ranjan Nanda from New Delhi, who noticed that when a patient has tuberculosis, they have a particular signature on their breath from something called volatile organic compounds that the tuberculosis produces. You know, the problem with tuberculosis that kills 1.7 million people in the world every year is a, a big problem is diagnosis, especially deep into the village. So Ranjan developed essentially this tuberculosis breathalyzer that fingerprints patients and shows, uh, uh, shows who has tuberculosis. So supporting and encouraging innovation is a great way to make sure poor countries uh, don't stay poor forever. Now, we've been uh, very, uh, very, very fortunate and very pleased to be able to support these innovations through Grand Challenges Canada, which is funded by the Government of Canada. We support bold ideas with big impact, like the examples I've been showing you, mostly um, with innovators in low and middle income countries and mostly um, uh, helping them pursue those bold ideas. And that is a way to make sure that a poor country doesn't stay poor. Now, it may be that I didn't find the absolute best ways to make sure a poor country stays poor. Maybe you could think of some other ones. But the ones I uh, mentioned to you, keeping high death rates of women and children, impeding the cognitive development of children, not tackling mental health conditions and stigmatizing them, and making sure that none of the ideas of people get translated into products or services, those are pretty good ways to make sure a poor country stays poor. And turning it around, tackling those issues, using innovation, enabling local innovators to pursue their bold ideas with big impact, to help their own families, their own communities, and their own countries represents a pretty good exit strategy from poverty. So I will, before, um, before closing, I want to thank you. And I want to say one more thing, which is where I began. I want to thank you all for what you're doing to take on the world. I want to thank uh, Caitlin McMaster for helping with this talk. And I want to thank um, uh, you especially, because it's people like Caitlin like my daughter Rebecca who's here, like all of you who will make a difference in helping to make sure that poor countries do not stay poor because there really is no reason that they need to if you tackle some of those root causes and you use innovation and you help countries to find an exit strategy from poverty using innovation. Thank you very much. <laughs>